Hi guys, this is the second part of Chapter 2 of All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, don't forget to keep up with your conflict charts and with um, thinking about point of view and your vocabulary log. Um, it's the same as in the first module. This is Module 2. Okay, so we've just finished the first part of Chapter 2. And to summarize, we talked about, uh, Paul talked about how he went from one world of being a teenager into the world of being trained for the war. They enlisted in the war and it became the reality of what that became was something very, very difficult and what they had to do and why they had to do it. So if you need to go back and read some more. And now we continue in this part. We talk a little bit more about Kemrich who was doomed to die after having been injured in the front. I sit by Kemrich's bed. He is sinking steadily. Around us is a great commotion. A hospital train has arrived and the wounded fit to be moved are being selected. The doctor passes by Kemrich's bed without even once looking at him. Next time, Franz, I say. He raises himself on the pillow with his elbows. They have amputated my leg. He knows it too, then. I nod and answer. You must be thankful that you've come off with that. He is silent. I resume. I, it might have been both legs, friends. Wegler has lost his right arm. That's much worse. Besides, you'll be going home. He looks at me. Do you think so? Of course. Do you think so? Sure, Franz. Once you've got over the operation. He beckons me to bend down. I stoop over him and he whispers. I don't think so. Don't talk rubbish, Fran. Don't talk rubbish, Franz. In a couple of days, you'll see for yourself. What is it anyway? An amputated leg? Here, they patch up far worse things than that. He lifts one hand. Look here, though. These fingers. That's the result of the operation. Just eat decently and you'll soon be well again. Do they look after you properly? He points to a dish that is still half full. I get excited. Friends, you must eat. Eating is the main thing. That looks good, too. He turns away. After a pause, he says slowly, I wanted to become I had Forrester once. So you may still, I assure him. There are splendid artificial limbs now. You hardly know there was anything missing. They're fixed onto the muscles. You can move the fingers and work and even write with an artificial hand. And besides, they will always be making new improvements. For a while he lies still, then he says, You can take my lace-up boots with you, for Mueller. That's an acknowledgement by Kemmerich that he knows he's going to die. It's a very sad place to be when you know for sure that you're not going to make it. He's not the first that I have seen thus, but we grew up together, and that always makes it a bit different. I have copied his essays. At school, he used to wear a brown coat with a belt and shiny sleeves. He was the only one of us, too, who could do the giant's turn on the horizontal bar. His hair flew in his face like silk when he did it. Cantrick was proud of him, but he couldn't stand cigarettes. His skin was very white. He had something of the girl about him. He was kind of like a girl. He was very sweet. I glance at my boots. They are big and clumsy. The breeches, those are pants, are tucked into them. Pants kind of like leggings are tucked into them. And standing up, one looks well-built and powerful in these great drain pipes. But when we go bathing and strip, suddenly we have slender legs again and slight shoulders. That means very small shoulders. We are no longer soldiers, but little more than boys. No one would believe that we could carry packs. It is a strange moment when we stand naked. Then we become civilians. And almost feel ourselves to be so. When bathing, Franz Kemrich looked as slight and frail as a child. There he lies now. But why? The whole world ought to pass by this bed and say, that is Franz Kemrich, 19 and a half years old. He doesn't want to die. Let him not die. Not recognizing the individual in a war state, 
not knowing when people are dying as there are people dying today in other worlds in other uh, continents and countries our soldiers other people's soldiers children not much older than you dying in other places and we've lost sight of the fact that they're individual people this is the point the author makes here my thoughts become confused this atmosphere of carbolic and gangrene clogs the lungs it is a thick gruel that's kind of like oatmeal it suffocates it grows dark Kemmerich's face changes color it lifts from the pillow and, and is so pale that it gleams my mouth moves slightly I draw near to him he whispers if you find my watch send it home I do not reply. It is no use anymore. No one can console him. I am wretched with helplessness. His forehead with its hollow temples. This mouth that now seems all teeth. His sharp nose. This sharp nose. And the fat weeping woman at home to whom I must write. If only the letter were sent off already. Hospital orderlies go to and fro with bottles and pails. One of them comes up, casts a glance at Kemrich, and goes away again. You can see he is waiting. Apparently, he wants the bed. I bend over Franz and talk to him, as though that could save him. Perhaps you'll go to the conv convalescent home in Klosterberg, among the villas, Franz. Then you can look out from the window across the fields to the two trees in the horizon, on the horizon. It is the loveliest time of year now, when the corn ripens. At evening, the fields and the light in the sunlight look like mother of pearl. And the lane of poplars, those are types of trees, by the clusterbach where we used to catch uh, sticklebacks. You can build an aquarium again and keep fish in it. You can go without asking anyone. You can even play the piano if you want to. So he's trying to fill Kemrich's vision before he dies with beautiful things so that he doesn't die without, with only the images of war in his, in his head. Such a sad thing, no? I lean down over his face, which lies in the shadow. He still breathes lightly. His face is wet. He is crying. What a fine mess I have made of it with my foolish talk. But Franz, I put my arm around his shoulder and put my face against his. Will you sleep now? He does not answer. The tears run down his cheeks. I would like to wipe them away, but my handkerchief is too dirty. An hour passes. I sit tensely and watch his every movement in case he may perhaps say something. What if he were to open his mouth and cry out? But he only weeps. His head turned aside. He does not speak of his mother or his brothers or sisters. He says nothing. All that lies behind him he is entirely alone now with his little life of 19 years and cries because it leaves him. This is the most disturbing and hardest part that I have ever seen. That I, ha I ever have seen. Although it was pretty bad too with Jaden, who called for his mother. A big bear of a fellow with wild eyes full of terror held off the doctor from his bed with a dagger until he collapsed. Suddenly, Kremrich groans and begins to gurgle. I jump up, stumble outside, and demand, Where is the doctor? Where is the doctor? As I catch sight of the white apron, I seize hold of it. Come quick, friends, Kremrich is dying. He frees himself and asks an orderly standing by, Which will be that? Which will that be? Like, who is that? He says, Bed 26, amputated thigh. He sniffs. How should I know anything about it? I've amputated five legs today. He shoves me away, says to the hospital orderly, you see to it, and hurries off to the operating room. I tremble with rage as I go along with the orderly. The man looks at me and says, one operation after another since five o'clock this morning. You know, today alone, there have been 16 death deaths. Yours is the 17th. There'll probably be 20 altogether. I become faint. All at once I cannot do any more. I won't revile any more. It is senseless. I could drop down and never rise up again. 
We are by Kemrich's bed. He is dead. The face is still wet from the tears. The eyes are half open and yellow like old horn buttons. The orderly pokes me in the ribs. Are you taking his things with you? I nod. He goes on. We must take him away at once. We want the bed. Outside, they are lying on the floor. I collect Kemmerich's things and untie his identification disc. The orderly asks about the pay book. I say that it is probably in the orderly room and go. Behind me, they are already hauling Franz onto the waterproof sheet. Outside the door, I am aware of the darkness and the wind as a deliverance. I breathe as deep as I can and feel the breeze in my face, warming, warm and soft as never before. Thoughts of girls, of flowery meadows, of white clouds suddenly come into my head. My feet begin to move forward in my boots. I go quicker. I run. Soldiers pass by me. I hear their voices without understanding. The earth is streaming with forces which pour into me through the soles of my feet. The night crackles electrically. The front thunders like a concert of drums. My limbs move supplely. I feel my joints. I can't read that word. Starting. I breathe the air deeply. The night lives. I live. I feel a hunger greater than comes from the belly alone. Mueller stands in front of the hut waiting for me. I give him the boots. We go in and he tries them on. They fit well. He roots among the supplies and offers me a fine piece of saveloy. With it goes hot tea and rum. So at the end of this chapter two, Kemrich has died. Paul revels in his ability to still be alive. He's helped his friend through the hardest moments of his life and will have the responsibility of telling Kemrich's mother what he died and when he died. And so it's something to see boys become men very quickly because of war and how they stand up for each other and how loyal they are and how very personal and impersonal the moment of one's death becomes. Something we'll all have to think about and face at some point in our lives, some before others. And so as you move forward in All Quiet on the Western Front, think about the pressures that these young men who were once just hanging out in school, reading books and having hobbies and playing games and doing their sports, became all too acquainted with the realities of life and death and war and power and greed and all of those things. Okay, so next up, Chapter 3, All Quiet on the Western Front, Module 2.